Okay, so let's start um, the next part of module 8, which will um, cover the um, survival analysis and the way we handle clinical data. So um, this slide shows you the overview. So we will go through the clinical data and survival analysis theory. It'll take us about half hour, maybe 40 minutes, depending on your questions. And then it will be followed by a lab on the survival analysis using the files that you're supposed to download from Wiki. So I will start with this slide and emphasize that the disease characterization involves uh, both the molecular profiling, such as whole genome or whole transcriptome profiling of tumor samples, and the clinical characteristics of given tumors. And the clinical data is intrinsically different types of data, which has to be integrated somehow with molecular profiling data. So uh, clinical data includes a number of clinical characteristics, such as uh, race, family history of cancer, involvement of um, lymph nodes, which is um, often referred to as nodal status, um, radiation the patient may has gone through, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, the uh, level of um, pertin um, um, pertinent proteins, stage and size, age at the diagnosis, and so on and so forth, and uh, grade of a tumor, for example. Another type of um, data, clinical data, arises when interest is focused on the time taken for some event to occur. Uh, one of the most common sources of such data is when we record the time from some fixed uh, point in time, such as surgery, for instance, to death of the subject, for example, or disease recurrence after surgery. And <coughs> these are referred to as survival times or survival data. And you can see here, this is an actual example of survival um, data in the red frame. Um, and they require a special set of analytical tools to be analyzed. And this is usually referred to as a survival analysis. Survival analysis has three main components or three common goals that are often used by researchers and are commonly seen in the literature. So one goal um, may be to estimate the probability of an individual surviving a given time period, for example, one year. Here comes a patient to the clinic with um, breast cancer, and we do um, um, uh, evaluate the patient with regard to a number of characteristics. And we would like to make a choice between, say, um, application of a quite serious chemotherapy versus um, just watchful waiting, for example. So if a patient has a relatively good prognosis, there is no need to apply really heavy duty chemotherapy, which is a component usually with a large number of side effects, which, which uh, adds additional morbidity onto the patient. So uh, this is a very often question. And for this, we use Kaplan-Meier survival curves, or a life table. Another common goal is to compare survival experience of two different groups of individuals. For example, patients who are um, taking the drug, going through chemotherapy, versus the ones who are not, or placebo. And for that goal, we use the log rank test, uh, which compares basically different uh, kaplan meier curves for each individual group of patients. And the third common goal 
uh, is the um, to detect clinical, genomic, or epidemiologic variables which contribute to the risk um, of patient. So which um, variables are associated with poor outcome. And for that, we use multivariate Cox regression model, a univariate in case of just a single uh, variable. But usually Cox is applicable to a multivariate uh, question where you have a number of um, uh, parameters that you want to test whether they contribute to the patient outcome. And this is called the multivariate Cox regression model. They're essentially the same. Kaplan Meier is a graphical representation uh, of the data that can be represented in a live table. So in clinical studies, survival times are often defined um, as the form um, um, defined as from the fixed point to an end point. And there may be different kinds of events that may uh, constitute, um, that can make up a survival times. So for instance, the starting point can be surgery and the end point can be death or recurrence or a relapse of the disease. Another combination is um, diagnosis as a starting point, and again, death, recurrence, or relapse as the end point. Another thing is the treatment that can be treated as a starting point, and again, the end point can be recurrence or relapse or death. There is one inherent feature of survival times that make, um, make them unique and unsuitable for any common statistical methods. And that is, we almost never observe the event of interest in all of the subjects under study. For example, in a study to compare the survival of patients having different types of surgery for breast cancer, although the patients have been followed, um, followed up for some, I don't know, 10 years, there will be many by the end of the study who will still be alive. So for these patients, uh, we do not know whether they will die. We only know that they're still alive. Nor do we know that the survival time from surgery, right? Because the event of in question death or relapse has not occurred. We only know that it should be longer than the period of the study. And so this is an incomplete observation and we call such survival times censored to indicate that the period of observation was cut off um, um, before the event of interest occurred. So these are censored observations. So now, again, this kind of data requires special analytical techniques, which I will describe now. Before I will do that, I will just elaborate a bit more on the censored observation so that it's clear what I'm talking about. So they arise whenever the dependent variable of interest represents the time to terminal event and the duration of the study is limited in time. Now, another intrinsic feature is that incomplete observation. Censored observation is incomplete. The event of interest did not occur at the time of the analysis or say the end of study. So what would be the examples of censored observations? For instance, the event of interest, death of the disease. So this is our endpoint. Now, censored observation was, uh, will be still alive. Now, for instance, in social studies, survival of marriage is the event of interest. Censored observation is still married. And then, uh, for instance, drop out time from school is the another example of event of interest. Still in school would be 
What are you smiling at it on? <laughs> survival of <laughs> I knew that would be, yes, well, big surprise, but still survive. it happens, you know, sometimes it does. <laughs> So, um, and still in school would be our censored observation. So we still need to understand that there may be multiple types of censoring, and it depends on the time continuum. I will briefly touch upon that. Um, so there is type 1 and type 2 censoring, and there is right and left censoring. So now, uh, type 1 censoring describes the situation when a test um, is, is terminated at a particular point in time so that the remaining items are only known not to have failed up to that time. So in that case, um, the censoring time is often fixed. And then we basically see what's the number of um, subjects have reached the um, event of interest. Whereas in type 2 sensor, sensory, we rather fix the proportion of individuals that have reached the event of interest, and then we measure the time for this to take place. Now, usually type 1 censoring is used in biomedical research. Now, uh, what is left and right censoring? So this slide shows you a situation for a right censoring up here, uh, left censoring, and another type of censoring, which is called an interval censoring. So here, on the, um, here we have individual patients lined up um, along the y-axis and time. So um, consider um, an experiment, for instance, when we start with um, n number of patients and terminate the experiment after a certain amount of time. In this experiment, the censoring always occurs on the right side because they, we do not know uh, when exactly um, um, on the right side because we do not know whether the patients who are still alive um, Will, well, when they will basically die of the disease. So when we're not certain about um, the event that is most likely will take place in the future. And, and this is the right censoring here. Okay? So now the left censoring is then, uh, for example, um, uh, we, we start with a number of patients and we follow up them for a number of months or years and we may not always know when cancer actually started in that particular patient. So when did the disease actually um, occur in that patient? So, and in that case, we're dealing with the left censoring. And then the interval censoring um, um, pertains when we know that the event of interest has occurred within a period of time, but we do not know exactly when. So, for example, the patient under the study um, uh, went, say, abroad for a year, and the disease relapsed sometime during his travel. So a uh, patient gets back and sees his doctor and it's obvious that the disease has come back, but now it is impossible to say exactly when. We just know the interval of time when the event occurred. So, and just to know that right censoring is the most common type of censoring in um, clinical uh, research. So now, yes? So, um I, I, mean, I guess intuitively you would just think it would be the left censoring because you never know when the cancer ever occurs in a patient. Yeah, and so that's why that's why this is not usually used for a starting point. So as I said, for instance, the starting point would be um, yeah. Usually, what we can do is we can use the date of admission to the hospital, for example. Right. Usually, it is a surgery or a certain treatment or putting a patient on some certain regimen as a starting point because indeed it is very hard to say. 
unless the patient has a family history and the family history um, uh, resulted in a frequent um, you know, uh, screening of a patient with regard to a certain parameter and we know exactly when the patient uh, uh, got cancer. Okay, so, yeah? Sorry, so, uh, further with that, uh, so if, if you're doing something like that where you, uh, you're setting it at, say, the, the time of diagnosis, um, so you might have, so in prostate cancer, you might have, like, a wide range of gleason scores for those patients, so would you bin them for your study, perhaps, based on their gleason score? Like, obviously, it might be difficult to compare someone with very high, uh, you know, well, I'm not a Gleason score though, but I, I can imagine that PSA level may be one of that. But, you know, as you know, PSA is not a perfect uh, predictor. And so there are some aggressive cancers with low PSA, and uh, there are some, uh, you know, um, completely um, the opposite situations when there is a really high level of PSA, but there is, there is no evidence of any um, malignant disease in the patient. So, and Gleason score, no, I don't think that it may be used in any of this way. Um, so, but you know what I mean, like in principle, that if you start choosing, like, it's kind of an artificial start, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it means, is there some need to, to accommodate for that, to correct for that? No, I, I don't really, no, no. I don't really see the point of using this and score in this. No, no. So, so w what I have showed you is the more frequent, more common um, starting and end point that people use. Because you know, basically, Gleason score pertains to the, the phenotype of tumor cells, right? How aggressive they are, what's the motility index, what's the invasion index, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so it doesn't, uh, and, and yes, you know, it's, it's related to the stage and, you know, basically um, uh, relates to how far tumor progressed and how aggressive the tumor is, right? But at the same time, it, it's, it's not used in this kind of things. So what I want to do with this slide is to um, explain to you how the survival time is used and how can we construct the kaplan Meyer curves. So let's see how the patients proceed usually through the study. So here um, the, the diagram on the left shows you the continuum, the time continuum, and patients in the study. So you see there, there is a um, 18 months in total. So the accrual of patients usually happens within first, say, six months, and then they would be followed up by um, uh, for further 12 months. And so the total period of a follow-up would be somewhere from, um, uh, you know, from 12 to 18 months. And so. Um, the most recently accrued patients, such as this one, the very bottom one, would be followed up with the shortest um, uh, time. So now we see that by the end of the study, um, four patients died, and these are represented by uh, filled circles, right? So here, one, two, three, and four. Two dropped out of the study. And these are shown with asterisks. So this one uh, is still alive, and it um, it didn't reach the end of the study, so it dropped. As well as this one, it's still alive, but it dropped out of the study. So thus, we have four uh, firm survival times, black um, filled circles, and six censored times. Now, what we usually do is that we ignore the, um, uh, the um, starting point for each patient, and we can reorganize uh, this uh, graph and get the uh, picture that you see on the right. 
uh, and we can reorder it by survival time to understand further how the data is handled. So, <coughs> so um, now this explains to you. So um, uh, these are dropped out patients. These are dead, and these are alive patients. So now, what is their survival probability for a given length of time? You can understand it um, uh, from looking at this uh, figure on the right. So the survival probability for a given length of time can be calculated considering time in intervals. And probability of survival month two is the probability of surviving month one multiplied by the probability of surviving month Two. And at each given interval of time, the probability of survival would be a proportion of patients who have reached the event. So the patients that dropped out obviously are censored, but those that they then just use, the, and the patients that reach the end of the study are also censored. Mm -hmm. They're not in, in some kind of probability analysis, those two different types of patients would be equally weighted. Yes, so they're both censored observations, whether they dropped out or, they or whether the end point of the study. Or whether they reached the time point of the study, the end point, but without reaching the event. So the patients that stayed alive and reached the whole end point of the study, wouldn't they be weighted more on? No, the they were just followed up for a longer time. But they would still be incomplete observations, and they still um, handle as censored observations. So, okay. And just to say that this uh, probability of surviving month two is conditional probability because the patient has to survive month one in order to make it to the month two. And so the overall probability now, after we have calculated probability at each and every time interval, will be a um, just a multiplication of all of these individual probabilities at, at each interval. And in the reality, time intervals contain exactly one case. So as soon as any single patient dies, this constitutes a individual time interval at which we compute the proportion of uh, uh, patients uh, who have succumbed to the disease. So the proportions um, um, now um, um, of these are calculated at each time interval, and the series of such calculations make up a so-called life table, which is then can be represented uh, by a curve, which is called Kaplan-Meier curve. And that's what you see here. So you see two groups of patients now, for which there is a um, uh, one Kaplan-Meier curve. So it's drawn as a step function. So here's the probability, survival probability from 0 to 1. And this is time in months. So this is a step function, as you see, and at, at each drop, we have a patient death or patient who has reached the event of interest. And censored observations are not considered as time intervals, but they are represented as tick marks on, on this particular um, curve. So, and basically, um, this function shows you um, the notation for the surviving probability. Now, what is the probability of a patient uh, to survive, say, two and a half months? And that patient belongs to the red group by a number of other parameters, molecular profiling or staging or uh, something else. So by going here, you can say that the survival probability is 0.5. Was the survival probability uh, at m uh, month one? It is definitely higher. So this is how you can use a, any single Kaplan-Meier curve 
you can estimate the probability um, of a patient who belongs to this cohort of um, uh, patients. What is the probability of the survival of a patient for um, the length of time n? So now, how can we compare um, different groups using Kaplan-Meier curves? So um, for the studies in which we uh, want to compare the survival experiences of two groups of patients, in this case um, uh, red and green, uh, we can construct two Kaplan-Meier curves for each group and see how they behave. So in theory, we can, sim we can simply calculate the proportions of survival subjects in each group at a given time point and compare them, right? So now what you can definitely say from these two curves is that the survival experience of treated patients are way better than untreated patients, okay? So now, and that's just a visual um, um, evaluation of this. Now, can we derive some statistics that will tell us uh, whether the survival experience between two groups is indeed significant? And for that, we use a log rank test for this purpose. Uh, it's a non-parametric method to test the null hypothesis that compared groups are samples from the same population with regard to the survival experience. So if the p-value is low, as with any uh, hypothesis test, then we can say that the chance that these are equal um, uh, survival experiences is quite low. So they are different. So um, the Logran test tells whether the survival experiences of two groups is different or not. But it does not tell how much different. And um, there is another metric um, used for that, which I will tell you about in a second. But uh, this is a test that gives you p-value with regard to the differences in survival experiences of two groups or multiple groups. So this method is based on a simple idea uh, which avoids the arbitrary decisions um, um, as to which particular uh, time point to pick in order to compare the proportions of uh, survived patients. That would be a very intuitively simple approach to see if the survival experience is different, and that is uh, take different uh, a certain time point and just to compare the fractions. So, but we do not know what particular point in time to pick for that purpose. So if, if we do um, choose some um, time point, it would be very arbitrary. So the long run test allows you to avoid that, the arbitrary decision on choosing the time point. So now the principle of the log rank test is to divide the survival time scale into intervals according to the distinct observed events in both uh, subgroups here, ignoring censored observations. Then um, the proportions um, at each interval are calculated and compared in a similar way as in chi-square test. So the principle is to compare proportions at every time interval and summarize it somehow. So this slide shows you the um, notation for the chi-square test. And below um, for the low rank, low rank test. So here we have uh, k uh, time intervals. And uh, similarly to the chi-square test, we have our observed proportions and uh, expected um, proportions, and then we just um, uh, take um, the subtract one from the other, sum it up, and then here we have a variance of uh, observed minus expected. And then similarly to the chi-square statistics, we compare with the chi-square distribution with uh, chi minus one uh, degrees of freedom and get the p-value. So that's the statistical background of this test. Now I told you. Uh, the low rank test does tell you whether the survival experiences of two groups are different statistically, but it doesn't tell you how different. To tell you how different, we uh, may use a hazard ratio, which tells you exactly how different. So hazard ratio 
um, compares two groups differing in treatments or prognostic variables or something and then uh, it measures relative survival in two groups based on the complete period studied so based on the complete timeline here so um, uh, so here's a notation for this one and um, so uh, the R basically the hazard ratio gives the relative event rates in the two groups so for example when R is equal point uh, 43 then relative risk or hazard of four outcome under the condition of group one is 43 percent of that of group two when R is say something like 2 then the rate of failure in group 1 is twice the rate in the group 2 so group 1 would be at a higher risk it needs to be noted though that um, uh, hazard ratio is computed for the entire period of study and may not be consistent throughout the time of intervals and so Kaplan-Meier curves are essential in this regard to visually inspect the consistency of differences in survival experience along the curves um, and so we may compute R for different time points and see how consistent that is with this so now I will move on to the last method that I'm covering before we move on to the lab so this is a way more complicated statistical um, uh, method I will briefly touch upon that so um, it's called the Cox proportional uh, hazard model which is used to investigate the effect of several variables on survival experience so um, let's read through that it says that it's a multivariate proportional hazards regression model uh, to model survival times again it is also called a proportional hazards uh, model because it estimates the ratio of the risks hazard ratio or relative hazard there are multiple predictor va variables such as prognostic markers um, whose individual contribution to the outcome is being assessed in the presence of the others and the outcome variable So the hazard function is closely related to the survival curve and represents the risk of dying in a very sh in some time interval after a given time. So um, so here's a um, formula for this. So we have um, axes as independent variables of interest such as tumor stage, tumor volume. Um, uh, the expression value of our bar marker or the level of um, uh, estrogen or testosterone or something else we want to include in, in this model so this would be X now B are the regression coefficients that will be estimated by a model so there is an assumption um, made um, under this model that the effect of variables is constant over time and additive in particular scale then similarly to the Kaplan-Meier uh, hazard function is a risk of dying after a given time assuming survival thus far so it's conditional similarly to the Kaplan-Meier then it's a, cu a cumulative function and H0 is a cumulative baseline or underlying function and then further the probability that we are interested in the probability of surviving to time t can be expressed through uh, the hazard function so this is basically an exponential of the negative of the hazard function so the Cox model must be fitted using an appropriate computer program we will be practicing it in R today so the final model will yield an equation for the hazard as a function of several covariates so how can we interpret the output from the Cox model so here on this slide you see the results of the Cox regression analysis on the randomized trial comparing uh, the drug versus placebo 
the chosen model included six variables. All of them are listed here in the first column. And they were initially tested for um, st a statistic um, significance alone, individually, and they were all significant at the 5% uh, level. So now, um, an important result um, of this model is a regression coefficient that you can see in the first, in the second column of this table for each of the covariates the Cox model gives you. So two important features of the coefficient, sign and magnitude. So sign can be positive and negative, and that will tell you the association with poor survival. So positive or negative association with poor survival. So now this will have negative association with uh, poor survival, and this would be a positive association, right? Now magnitude is another important feature of this. It refers to the increase in hazard for an increase of one in the variable of that particular covariate. Another important thing here is the exponential of the coefficient, which is here. And I will tell you why in a second. So this will tell you, um, this uh, will tell you that by increasing, um, say, the serum bilirubin by one, you will get this much increase in the risk for that particular patient who has higher levels of serum bilirubin um, in terms of the survival. And for example, um, uh, with regard to the therapy, which is a binary um, covariate, it's either you give a patient a therapy or you don't. So, so now if you don't give a patient um, a therapy, right, um, there will be an increase in risk of dying by 168%. So that's how we interpret that. So the hazard function is, again, the same, the step function. And we can express survival function through hazard function, as I showed you in that formula above. And then we can plot it as a survival curve similarly to the Kaplan-Meier curve. So this is just one of the examples. And so here is the survival function. And just to mention, this is called a prognostic index that you may uh, see in the literature. So uh, now, the power of the analysis, I have to stress, depends on the number of the terminal events, deaths, for example, or relapse of the disease. And sometimes it takes uh, many, many years to follow up, um, a follow-up to compile the data that will give sufficient power. Um, that's why student, uh, studies normally use other endpoints instead of death, which are more frequent. So for example, recurrence time. So um, of course, increase the sample size is another way to achieve power. Um, and unfortunately, it is not very simple to estimate the required sample set, and there are uh, ways to help you with that, and these can be some uh, nomograms that can help you, for instance, for prostate cancer, to calculate the appropriate sample size. So now I will briefly summarize what we have learned here, and we will move on to the lab, where we will um, apply uh, the knowledge that uh, you have just acquired. So clinical data is a highly important component as an intrinsically different from genomic transcriptomic data. Survival data is a special type of data requiring special methodology. Main applications of survival analysis include estimation of survival probability of a patient for a given length of time under given circumstances. We use Kaplan-Meier survival curve for that. Comparison of survival experiences of groups of patients, uh, for example, to ask the question whether the drug works um, or surgery uh, is helpful. And for that purpose, we use the log rank test. And then we may uh, want to investigate uh, the risk factors that may contribute to the outcome of the patient, 
um, with the goal to make a prognosis for a given patient and choose appropriate therapy. And for that, we use Cox regression model. So, um, if you have questions, you can certainly start asking them. Um, we can move on to the lab, and while uh, people are um, pulling out necessary files, you can ask me some questions.